were market makers because of that original tax. So that is why we are saying 10 years uh, of, of, uh, of internet. And thank you for coming to listen to people who were there 10 years ago and who are building the businesses of your future here, uh, uh, here for, for, for the next 10 years. Now, a couple of words on Mongo, uh, and I won't bore you. We, are, we think the region continues to need platforms. We think the region is not only about having venture funds that only invest in companies. We think our founders and our entrepreneurs need to have a lot of support, need to have mentors, need to have all sorts of other supports than simply money. Money is there. A lot of money coming out here. But the good entrepreneurs are not only about money. And all of us in the community, in the ecosystem, those ecosystem builders are needed here. We think of it. We think of ourselves this way. It's not only a venture fund. We invest uh, now to one of the extreme pre idea, uh, uh, idea stage companies to help them build their business and take them to places. Because uh, as things start to as people start having ideas, somebody needs to come at the very early days, uh, like a family and friend. But not actually have the friend that actually has to be. So we are that. We want to do things with entrepreneurs and we want to help the ecosystem happen. And now we will hear from three incredible role models in the region. Uh, Magnus Olsen, please, co founder of Karim, Maria Apaya, co founder of Karim. And we are to in fact, we have two, we have two, uh, uh, somebody had a, uh, yes, where are the seconds now? There's one there. Somebody is going. Who's going? Yeah. People didn't know that you actually had to upload the web uh, browser. There was dropping this. We were, we were demo things on laptops and people said, can we buy the laptop? But that's not the internet. This is your website. <laughs> so that's, uh, okay, I don't want to bore you with the story, but I think something to walk into you know, Mac 2 with the talent that he had. We had built a small core engineering team. And, you know, in the last year. In the last year. We had teams involved. And really, we, I was passionate about trade, like my dad is a trader. The companies we were dealing with all were hungry to export, and just it was very difficult for them to go through, list their products, get listed on Yahoo, get the exposure they need to export. But whenever they did, actually, they were successful. So I think that Samir evolved into a, a, you know, a, a portal with content. We were looking at monetizing it. We built a section on, on it called Mazat Mac 2 was a disaster, but we tried. The original name was Mazad Maktoum. The original name, even the company we registered was Mazad Maktoum. Mazad is auction. We tried that. It was inspired by Yahoo. I think they were doing well in Japan. They probably still have a, a commerce section in Japan. It's one of the only places probably they have this working. And then over time, we realized being on Maktoum wasn't working well because we're trying to build trust. And we wanted merchants and we wanted destination for, for, for commerce. And it was just a bit confusing with what the portal did. It wasn't focused. The problems were different. We purchased the name Su, I think, in two or six. And we came to Hawaii, three people, two people in Amman. Samir so gave us a basement room near the gen set. We had the smoke when the was right? And they see. So that you can be. I remember the room was great. And then, you know, we came into Hawaii. And we built How much money did you aim today? I think 350. The number was small. Yeah, it was reasonable. We managed to keep that for a year or two, and then obviously we needed more funds. Uh, but we had a simple side, asset list. Yes. E-commerce requires a bit more infrastructure. We yes. didn't know at the time. We, I think, launched only a mobile category. People were buying the Nokia flip phones. <laughs> so we figured they uh, And then we had no way to get people online because everything was dialed up. Yeah. So everything was SMS. You bid, you list. You bid, you get an SMS, you get an SMS, you log in. It was just a simple, primitive, mobile, internet, combo service. These guys that are really business is now having so easy, right? Easier, but they have different challenges. <laughs> and, you know, we were a green field. And just the service was working. Every day we log in, we see more items. Every day we log in, we see more orders. Literally, we used to pay every seller with one. We had a guy who goes to the bank with cash and said, you sold 20 dirham, here we pay you back. As a seller, we would, we would accuse it, the bank started kicking us out. You guys can't come with 300 deposits, you need to build like one deposit a day. So we started, you know, innovating around like an account page where you have 
literally your balance, you will draw the fund. We, yeah. we, we kept paying cash flow, I think, for five million a day. Then the central bank came and said, what are you guys doing depositing all this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then they said, okay, we need to move to an electronic payment. And then yeah. we really pivoted in 2.10 post the Mac2. I think going back to Mac2, we, we got post, the first, post Mac2, before Mac2. Mac2, I think we got some allocation from the team. And we looked at the from business. Tiger, we got from Tiger, Tiger. and from and from the from the from, from the job bar, the job bar, yeah, the deal. And then we said, okay, what we need to do to grow this? And we said, you know what, we don't want to be a C two C site. We want to shut down our car section, our classified sections, remove the option. We call it retirement, and we just focus on building. It was ten percent of our business was B two C. We added a buy now, then car, very primitive, and then you know, we the rest is this. Wow, what a story. Um, so first of all, great to be here. And uh, I think we should all uh, celebrate Farid. Uh, he has been uh, you know, our grandfather, and I'm sure everyone's grandfather. He has. Look at his right here, right? I can't be his grandfather. <laughs> Sure to do the maths. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, we were talking about you just yesterday. You helped us in the early stage of your to define our culture and values. I remember that session. Yeah, was a So our story, I mean, we're a little bit younger. Uh, we seven, a bit more than seven years. And uh, many of you might have heard the story, but I won't bore you with all the details. But it was really a... Uh, that was an anecdote. It was really a desire to do something uh, meaningful in this world. Right? In my case, I had had a brain bleeding and almost died. And when you get a second chance in life, you get a chance to think about what you actually care about. And for me, it was this deep desire to do something meaningful to help people. And my co-founder, Lasser, he uh, also had a deep desire to do something meaningful and big. He realized that why haven't we built any awesome big companies in this part of the world? And he's from Pakistan. He's like. 200 million people, you have one company that has a market value of more than a billion dollars. And it's not about the billion dollars, but it's about why haven't we built it? So I think uh, the two of us got together uh, with a passion for doing something meaningful and big. We looked at many different things education, healthcare, fish farms. Um, and then someone came up with the idea why don't you do transportation? And, and more specifically, why don't you do Corporate transportation. You were at McKinsey then. I was at McKinsey. We were both. When I mean, you get a second chance in life and someone tells you, why don't you go out and build a corporate uh, transport company, it really doesn't feel very meaningful. So <laughs> we were like, no, this is not going to happen. But then the more we looked at it, we realized that we can actually use this as a vehicle to, to do something good. Uh, we can turn drivers into captains. We can you know, not only give them an income, but, but treat them well. We can solve the mobility challenge in the region. No one wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I want to do transportation. People wake up in the morning and say, I want to go to school, or I want to take my kids to, I want to take my kids to school, or I want to go to work. And you know, in the UAE, it's still relatively simple, but in, in countries like Saudi or Egypt or Pakistan, it's, or Baghdad for that matter, it's, it's, it's far. So we said, okay, let's do it, let's call it Kareem. So we remember why we're doing it, because we want to be Kareem. We want to be Kareem to our customers, to our captains, to our colleagues. And it's, Kareem.com was free. It's hard to find, uh, it's hard to find uh, six, six letter acronym uh, websites. And I think uh, that there's so many more stories, but, but similar to not as crazy as your war stories, I think. But you have to start small and hustling and just get started. Right? I, if that's the one message that I keep telling everyone. Sometimes entrepreneurs come to me and say, hey, I've been working on this business plan for a year. And I'm like, seriously, we lost a year. Kareem, we started on the first day of Ramadan, 2012. Very blessed day, uh, 22nd of July. Um, everyone kept saying Ramadan Kareem, so we got three other times. And um, from the first day till the time we did our first drive was five and a half weeks. From idea to first, to first revenue. Now that revenue was not a very pretty revenue. We had a little dinky website you could go to. You could put in a pickup location and a drop-up location. 
at a, a time that was pre-scheduled, you could not book on demand, you could put in your credit card number and you could click book. And then we got an email, it looked very pretty on the website, but on the back end, me and the Russell got an email that, hey, this is new booking. And that email went to a phone, and that phone had a very loud ring, ring signal so that we would notice that the new booking came in. Because sometimes people book in the middle of the night. So we took turns sleeping with this phone. A, 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 A at 3 a.m. New booking at 5 a.m. No technology. Off booking from uh, JVT, Jumeirah Village Triangle, also known as the Bermuda Triangle. You go in there, you never come out. Uh, booking is from Street 5, Villa 11. There is 20 Street 5 in JVT. So, you know, we have a list of captains, we have met at the airport, and then we interviewed sitting, you know, outside the airport. We call them. How is my Are you free? Busy or free? Busy, busy, free, busy, busy. Ah, Gushi Pai, busy or free? Busy, who? Ahmed, busy or free? Free, 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 yalla. We have a booking. Street 5, Villa 24. Okay, how do you go? I see a roundabout. Which roundabout? We were guiding the captains without no technology, just looking at the map and trying to get the right. We sent an SMS manually to the customer. Your dream is on the way. Here's the captain. It looks very professional for the for the customer. In the back end, it was us sitting and sending the message. At the end of the trip, the captain called us and said, "I drove 143 kilometers because I looked at the, the meter. So you can charge the customer for 43 kilometers." They reported it by phone. The second iteration of the product was that they reported it by SMS manually. They sent in, you know, how many kilometers. This was a, the kitchen was a kitchen. And it was like, we spent, well, it, was, it was in the kitchen. It was in the kitchen. <laughs> Every single booking, we spent 25 minutes of manual time on, 25 minutes. And we were like, how on earth is this ever gonna scale? 25 minutes. And yes, we started in, um, we set up the company in Dubai, because Dubai was easier than Abu Dhabi. Even though I live in Abu Dhabi, we set it up in our first office was in Shadow Tower. Shadow Tower was the cheapest building in Dubai. Why is it the cheapest building in Dubai? Because it has the crappiest elevators in the world. That's where we started. We lived on, they had chicken biryani in the little uh, grocery store downstairs. It was 11 dirhams. We ate that every single day. So sick of it. You know, I can't eat the Me and Nasser, we took. Because we had one car each in our families, but our wives used it, and they were working both of them, so they were making some income, so you know, they deserved to have the car. Yeah. We took the bus between Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Wow. Uh, I love the bus between Yeah, there, there is one, but you have to go a little bit off the beaten yeah. track to find it, but yes, there is a bus. And, and um, I think the message, for, you know, my reflection is, you just have to start. You have no clue what the customers want, and you just need to you know, so, uh, so you really didn't think of the challenges as you started, because you wanted to start, and, and then and then you discovered the challenges as you were going. It's like Reid Hoffman says, you build an entrepreneur builds a business while jumping from the plane and building the airplane while uh, before he lands, right? Before he crashes. For sure, and I think you know, some of the examples, some of the examples you mentioned on, on, on payments. I mean, when we started, I remember, I think CyberSource wanted. 30,000 euros deposit to get the payment data. Yeah. We don't have any 30,000 euros. Now, we had some bus stuff at the banks. We got one of these post machines. Uh, I think for free, or we borrowed it, I think. And we could key in the credit card numbers on, on the trip. So, after at the end of every day, we printed a list of all the trips that had happened. And we sat and we did 16 digit credit card number, 4 digit expired date, and then. Every single trip. We did this for a year and a half. First, I wasn't doing this. I was basically running the payments. But after a year, I think I was getting tired of it. So our colleague number one, Akash, he took over. He ran operations and credit card machine. And then he got tired of it. And at that time, I had a personal captain, a personal driver driving me up and down on the lobby. And no bike. And you know, he drove me in the morning. And then he sat the whole day until the night and then he drove me home. It was a waste of time. He said, no bike. Now you are our new payment gateway. <laughs> you can rely on your payments. And he's had them keep in every single time. I mean, this is not important. Like, it's not, it's not going to be easy, but you have to do it. And I think this is the beauty. 
A lot of things have gone easier, but by, go, by doing the things that are not easy, that's how you can have an edge. And you told us this. it was easy, everybody was doing it. You told us so many times, uh, and I quote, Pauli, quote, Arabics, everything that was hairy, operational, messy, difficult, crappy, I'm going to do it because no one else is going to do it. We took it as a I love it. Absolutely. You, you go where nobody wants to go. Yeah. And, and your stories about how Arabex was driving in the war zone was the only one allowed to cross the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We use donkey. You <laughs> <laughs> loved it. I mean, that's a true story. You have an Arabex donkey during the Antifada. And we had to bypass, we had to bypass the Israeli uh, 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 checkpoints with our courier bags from, from Nablus to, uh, to Ramallah, etc. And so we, we can't cross by cars, so we had young. Uh, young gentlemen, I want to say boys, who had donkeys for us, and we would cross through the uh, through, uh, through the fields from one place to another so that we don't. So yes, do you think do you think the donkey nationals will do that? <laughs> <laughs> do you think UBS will use a donkey one day? <laughs> I remember one particular funny story because uh, in the early days. We, uh, we and they used to make fun of us, by the way. They used donkeys. I said, yes, at least we're going to use our dead packages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who cares? We don't use that thing. You know. But I, I tell people, you need to be crazy about the customer, right? That's the only thing you have. You need to get people to love you. So we had this group. We never missed a booking. You have three scheduled bookings. So we had two hours to find a car. Sometimes there was no cars available. We called the hotels. We took a car. We called the golf clubs. We stopped cars on the road. We did whatever we had to do to never miss a booking. One time we had a booking from Abu Dhabi. It was a very senior management consultant going from the hotel to the airport. Important booking because we're going to the airport. We didn't have a single car in Abu Dhabi. We called everyone, we called the hotels, we called the golf clubs, we called the taxis. No one had a car there. I called my wife, Sarah, where are you? I'm in the mall uh, with my two-year-old daughter and her mom, 17-year-old mom. Put them in Starbucks, <laughs> go to the car, put the car seat in the back, take the ball, we'll drive up to the Al Towers and pick up this guy and take him to the airport. Tell him. The question is, are you still married? Yeah! And he has a second game. I think we tried that. But I'm really glad you should have your work So you're, you're about time, about 15 years now already? Oh. Hey? My entrepreneurship story. No, no, much longer. I, I so met, uh, when did you come here? In the 90s. In the mid 90s. In the mid 90s, after the Arab Spring, I got something. Sorry? In 1997 or 98, we have already been public on that. You had. And you had uh, Info4, yes. which eventually Arab Spring acquired. Correct. Uh, that was the first exit. We don't want to talk about that one, <laughs> even though it was a cool, uh, a cool exit. Yeah. But so you, you've been around, Gabriel. Uh, so your, your story is a bit different uh, than our buddies here, and, and eventually me. Uh, but you did your business, you had a chance to exit during the uh, In the very early days, it didn't work. You wanted, you built the business to stay. So, uh, I mean, and businesses can be built to stay. Not everything for, is for, for, for exits, right? So tell us. So uh, I, guess, I, I guess for me this is uh, two decades of entrepreneurship, hence the great beard and the great hair. Um, but it's also trying to emulate Fadi, who's always been uh, the godfather and the uh, role model. That's a better grandfather. So I guess the start of my entrepreneurship. Journey was at 25 years old. I set up Infofort in Dubai. Uh, Infofort was the first records management in the Middle East region. We stored people's documents for them. It's not in the music industry, it's not as sexy as it sounds. But and it makes a lot of money. But that was the deal. So when I first started Infofort, it was a warehousing business. And I remember, uh, similar to the other stories, um, I basically did everything, so I had no employees. And I remember I'd go around with this box and knock on door after door, customer after customer, trying to win them over as customers. And uh, one of, uh, you know, by the hundredth door, I had knocked on me over next door. And the gentleman who had his finance there, a wonderful human being, uh, started asking me about myself. And 
said, where do you come from, where did you grow up, where did you go to university? I explained that I had studied at Stanford University, did electrical engineering, did investment banking, and he saw me carrying that box and felt sorry for me. <laughs> and he was the very first contract I signed. <laughs> so it was pity that won my first uh, business. It and, and it worked. Yeah, exactly. And from there, the, the business picked up. And as we said, we were making within a year and a half 50% margins, growing across the region. We never needed outside investment. It was just a massive uh, yeah, such a <laughs> business. In the very early days, uh, I met uh, Buddy, who was always the role model at Aiken, Aramex Public. And uh, he told me in that first meeting that one day uh, I'll buy this business from you. And I said, sounds like a deal to me. <laughs> it, took uh, it, it took us seven years. Seven and then uh, we, we eventually did that. Um, and so then the journey of Bay started in 2000, where I was at the time a 20-year-old man, uh, young man, making a lot of money, um, but feeling that I wasn't making the impact that I wanted to my community. And the internet switch had just come on in the region, so this is again two decades on, and I thought there was an amazing ability to leverage the power of this thing to again change people's lives and to really have social impact. And the area where I thought we needed the most help was with unemployment. Uh, the region had the highest youth unemployment rates in the world. And a lot of that had to do with information mismatch. There wasn't a place where employers and job seekers could find out about each other. And so that's how the idea uh, came, came together. And as soon as it did come to the idea was uh, came to me, I started putting together a founding team. And again, similar to what we talked about with the Naku Mafia, uh, the Bank Mafia was formed. And so Danny Fatha, who now heads Eco, who is invested also in a lot of different internet businesses, uh, came to Bank and was our chief operating officer and headed our sales. Uh, Mona Abaya, who heads Mom's World right now, um, was our head of marketing. She was heading Johnson Sinclair in Europe. Uh, she left that to start Bay. And Akla, who is our CTO, uh, and also now an angel investor and advisor for many businesses came in and started the culture. And from the beginning, we said we wanted to build a wonderful business that could survive us where the objective wasn't to sell the business, but really to provide wonderful long-term impact in the region, even more than otherwise. And again, you know, part of the role model there was once again funny in the sense that the beauty of the Aramex was it was a company that was started in the region that went public in the US. And that sort of showed that we could actually build amazing businesses that were world-class institutions. And the intention of Bay from the beginning was to build a world-class institution that could survive its founders. Uh, along the way, we built other businesses and built them to sell them. So, for example, we built a business called Bonabit, which was another part of the sort of Bay Mafia, which one year to the date after starting it, we sold it. Uh, one year on, uh, the people who bought it from us shut it down. <laughs> I started everything. And, and did that. So, but it, again, this talks about, you know, there are lots of reasons to start a business, and you can start them to trade them, to build them for the long term, and they're all reasonable outcomes, I think. Um, I've built businesses to sell them. The purpose of Bank has really been about building it for the long term, and hopefully, as something And you eventually woke, woke everyone up, and, and you are uh, you have institutional investors, yeah. and institutional investors, unfortunately, are, are short-term investors. They, they will not last more than 10 years. They want to give money back. It's a temporary marriage. So, so, what's so how did you solve that temporary so marriage? What's, what's amazing, I think, in, in, again, generational differences in this case, I think when I started, uh, so we started Bait when the dot-com bubble had burst globally. Um, June of 2000, there was a dot-com bust, and there was a trillion dollars of market cap lost over a few months in the US stock markets. You were about to sell the company, then you... Uh... Uh, no, this was, we hadn't started Bait yet, and here we are, the internet switch had come on in the Middle East, and yes. we were coming around saying, okay, now that the bubble had burst, yes. we're about to start an internet business when dot-coms... So everybody happened. was coming back from Harish, and we were going. <laughs> and we were going. <laughs> And so the story had ended. Where are you going, man? I'm going to the Harsh, but it's not on the way. And 
And so we, we put in our mind back then that we wanted to raise a certain amount of money and we would make the business profitable with that amount of money. And if we were not able to make it profitable, we would shut our doors and leave. Um, so we raised that amount of money. It wasn't from institutions. Yeah. And so we raised $3 million in 2000, which was pretty crazy at the time. And when we later got Tiger, uh, they came in purely as secondary, not as primary. So by then, 18 months, they, into, they exited the other, uh, yeah, 18 months into the business, we were profitable, cash flow positive, and we've never required can happen since then. So we've been 20 years without any external capital. How many people have their businesses profitable now? <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so, uh, yeah. so I think this is a generational thing. I've been involved, obviously, in businesses that are continually raising money. I think, obviously, if you are raising a lot of money, uh, you eventually have to sell the business. There's no way you can raise from a lot of investors who in turn raise from the last You have to get an exit. In our case, the fact that we didn't have to get a lot of money, the fact that we were profitable and cash flow positive, meant that we could continue to run this. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Incredible intro. I, I want uh, to go a, a little bit mechanical here and, and talk about the region and the ecosystem and the challenges in the ecosystem. Our research at Wata, uh, five, six years ago, came out with about six or seven things that entrepreneurs tell us are their challenges. They talk about markets, talent, mentors, clients, funding, and exits. These are the challenges. If there are others, you can raise your hand and say there are others. So let's Let's talk about that. Let's talk about your challenges in these issues. So let's start with markets. So how are you going to be able to scale the business? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back. Scale the business in the region without access to markets. And what are the challenges of the access to markets? What, what were your challenges? Because I remember when you came to me, if you remember, back during the, uh, uh, the import days, your first question to me is, how would you actually establish markets in many geographies? How did you do that? And I told you this was how, how we were able to be successful because we conquered geography. How did you conquer geography? So I, I think your advice was prices and it remains prices. Um, the regulatory environment was and remains a, a very difficult obstacle. So obviously, in every single country you're in, you have to uh, go off and get a new registration. The registration rules and the costs vary tremendously from place to place. The cost is very high. And even when you do register, there is no guarantee that you can continue to operate. I mean, just as recently as, uh, I mean, we continue to face these challenges. So even two decades ago. I want to the challenges we have in, in my home. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, but all across the region, what ends up happening is even if you do regulate, you do whatever they ask of you. Ten years later, you might still get a knock on your door and say, ah, we decided that you no longer fit under this classification. And I think one of the funny things in this part of the super world um, is the requirement to classify yourself as something. So when we register a company in the US or Europe, you can put in your articles of association a purpose. And that purpose could be to pursue any commercial activity. Um, here, you need to be a something. A right hair hitting company, a whatever. Most of these things, so I remember when I registered Infoport, which was the first records management business in the Middle East, I went to the economic department and said, I want to register this type of company. They said, Here's the book, find it in the book. I looked, I said, It's not in the book. They said, Well, you can't have your company. I'm like, Wait, you know, this is a business that exists all over the world. Why can't it exist here? Um, they eventually said, pick something else. The problem with pick something else is that every other aspect of your economic activity becomes restricted. So I picked the warehousing category, and lo and behold, when I wanted to hire developers for a warehousing company, you don't get developers. Okay, I want data entry. Exactly. So I want a data entry operator then. So then I get a programmer labeled as a data entry operator. His problem then was he couldn't get visas, he couldn't travel, he couldn't, and so this naming thing is a, a, an issue, uh, an issue that continues to, to haunt us. And the regulatory framework is something that there have been many positive strides. Yes. Um, it is, it is, they're trying. There's foreign investment that's allowed now, that wasn't allowed back then, you needed to. And Dubai is a, is a prime example of how they actually engage, I mean, the, the Dubai Future Foundation engages us and tells us 
what is it that you need to resolve, what are the issues, and let's find together the way to resolve it. And, and I couldn't agree more. So I think the reasonableness here, even if something happens, you always have someone to speak to. Right. Magnus, are we doomed to, are we doomed in the region to be continuously in the business of committing sin and then asking for forgiveness? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'll rephrase the question. <laughs> Do we launch the business before we get regulated and then tell regulators, I'm sorry, uh, uh, what do you want me to do? I am already in business, please regulate me. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Is, is that what you did? Yes, yes. But I, I want to add this is a funny, this whole classification problem. In theory, you know, getting visas was tricky in the beginning. And there was this visa allowance per office size. And we were running a call center from here, so people were working shifts. So then you really need all these uh, visa accounts, you actually need three per, per seat, so it was very tricky. Um, and uh, you need all this paperwork to get the visa. So for the longest time, me, Lasser, everyone, we were customer service representatives in the, in the visa, because you don't need to prove papers when, when you were customer service. So everyone in Korea was customer service rep in, in the visa, but then you get problems when you, when you travel. So. <laughs> but, uh, but we launched. But we launched. And, and uh, eventually, you were also in a place where were you a taxi company? Were you a limo yeah. company? What were you a technology company? So, so we were um, we were actually a little bit close to the market. So the reason we set up in Tcom versus in JLT or one of the other reasons. I mean, number one, it was the cheapest. I think. Maybe JLT was a little bit cheaper, but we took we spent a little bit more for Tcom because we said we will look like an internet company, and it's important that we look like an internet company, and thus we don't want to look like a transportation company because we're not a company. So that's what we did. Now, um, I think when you go to someone and ask them, you know, am I allowed to do this? People don't like to say, I don't know, or, you know, you're not in the book. So then the answer default becomes no, right? Now, if you ask someone and someone says no, and then you do it anyway, then you're actually, you know, going against them. So then it's better not to ask. And by the time you are big enough that someone comes knocking on the door saying, what are you doing? You know, then you should celebrate, because then you have become something, because I'm not dead. Tell him I dare you, come down. Yeah, so I think, uh, I think that's the general principle. Now, this notion of, uh, of the region, I, and this is a passionate topic for me. I, I speak about the region to anyone that wants to listen, and we have had to pitch a lot to investors. Right? The beautiful story is, from Morocco to Pakistan, 700 million people, it's almost 10% of the world if you round up a little bit. Average age is 25, super young, open to innovation, open to trying new stuff, smart from penetration 50%, higher than China, in the cloud it's like 200%. It's like the most exciting market in the world ever. That's the investment. <laughs> now the reality <laughs> is that it's, I'm lying. <laughs> it's like it's a pain in the butt because it's like multiple different countries. Guess how many legal entities we have in Korea? We have 15 countries. 15 countries, you have like 30, one. correct. 30? 30, 30, 30, <laughs> 30 <laughs> legal entities. It's just like, why? So I go to Dubai courts, Dubai notary, at least once a week. I used to go every other day. I go there every week. I'm, they you know, I'm high five the whole, <laughs> the whole thing. I go there every day. Every, every week. Anyways, um, how to expand, right? When we went into Saudi, the you went immediately. Uh, uh, one year, year. You one year, year. Year. one year, yes. We knew we had to go in. You couldn't even get into the country. Now you get a tourist visa online in 20 minutes, you get the visa. We didn't even know how to get in. So we had some friend, we knew a friend, we knew a friend, sent us a visa. And then when we met Abdullah, he came on board as a co founder. He was the he was running training. So was was it was his soul, it was his you know, uh, sole proprietorship. When we launched in Egypt, this amazing woman called Hadir launched Egypt for us. It was her personal company that was carrying in Egypt for the longest time. And I gave you an office now, man. You gave us, everyone gave us, you know, pity pit, pit works, so you know, someone gave us an office over there, someone gave us an office over there. Office office over there. <laughs> this is how we work. I remember in, when we launched in Doha, it was very complicated. These days it's hard to talk about in this country, so let's just talk about it. But, uh, but, uh, when I lost them, 
when we launched that, uh, we didn't couldn't set up a company. So we formed the limousine company because we anyways had to work with these guys. And we said, hey, can we, can you hire one guy on your books and can we have a small office in your office? Right. We had to innovate. Right. Now, today, seven years later, we have 30 companies and blah, blah, blah. You, you but what I'm telling, you know, from governments, the one thing that Dubai or Abu Dhabi could do, and I hope they would do, is we should get the business license to set up here, and then with that license you can operate the country. Because if the region doesn't get its act together, I think this is the most important thing that the GCC can do, and say one license, one region. Because. If you launch in China, you have one and a half billion customers. If you launch in yes. India, you have one and a half billion. You launch in Europe, you launch in the US, you launch here. You, yes. you talk about the promise of 700 billion, but that's what you're really not, uh, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, pitch it, I'm pitching. <laughs> Ronnie, uh, and, and you, uh, uh, so you, you have 26. 26, 26, 3 countries, 26, because we have 26 companies. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, why are so where is the next day of value? They couldn't understand why we have so many bank accounts. They couldn't, like, why do you have so many bank accounts? <laughs> 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 That's an awesome thing. Maybe you know something to the family there, right? <laughs> well, but, 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 I mean, how much are you doing? I mean, imagine that you're only in three countries. You talk about so and so and so. But look, I mean, five. We have 22 countries, man. Why are you not in all these countries? We have to go back. Right. We, we even went to Kuwait and we have to pull back. It's just too hard to operate in neutral because the infrastructure, the rules for us, it's import rules, product import rules. So you have to be an import product. Suddenly you move from setting up to every other Let me ask you a question. Is this a process of the old mercantile families in the region being very protectionist and worried about e commerce coming into their market? I think, is this it? Uh, I think the distribution models everywhere else have evolved, right? You don't have the setups that exist. All no, you can say, by the way, if you regret, uh, I mean, chop a chip, as you know, uh, some of you love it, some of you hate it. Uh, but chop a chip was selling products from the United States to every single country in the region. It was not about soup. We didn't need licenses. And, and Amazon, when they were selling in the region, Ronnie, well, you needed 35 companies or how many? Amazon was selling in the region without even having a license. When we exited, even then, 45. Yeah, there's a weirdness to the story. 50% of the commerce was coming from Arab Springs. Yes. People this. forget the original e-commerce company in the region is Shop and Share. Yes. <laughs> but we didn't need licenses. We just sold products. Okay. You didn't even have to license the products. No, no. Yeah, it was so not. Just up locally. You can go publish Amazon. If you want to publish something on Amazon, go to, go to Seattle. I'm sorry. But that's all. You're very wrong there. No, 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 So tell us. What do you want to know? Okay, so I go to the next topic. I guess we need that topic. Okay, you talk about talent. Let's do it with the talent. We're all in the business of talent. Tell us about the challenge of talent in the region. Is there talent in the region? How were you recruiting talent in the early days? What is the challenge of talent today? I love people. Who you have two minutes because now we're going to the rest. Of I love people who try to be entrepreneurs, who have not done well maybe as entrepreneurs, uh, have Afghani and from the region. I went uh, give you good examples. Amar Sugudi tried to do a lending company when the real estate crash. He ran our payment business. I went to the Esgat Hussain, who was at the time employed by India as a contractor, but actually he had a business that had failed, uh, like he had a digital photography. So you looked at everything, wherever he did, and then you said you were a good guy. Esgat's are good because when they come, they know they have to build. They're not going to come and say, you know what, I'm now the CTO or the GM or the technology. Let's go hire 60 other people because I can't do that. Is that you hire I don't, I, we, We've been successful in Jordan. How many people do you have in Europe? Probably have 500 people. Engineers? Not all engineers, but the country of America. Are you are recruiting? Uh, I mean, a testament to the Jordanian engineers, most of them are now in Seattle. We, this is my, I'm not happy about it. I used to get this when Amazon global teams recruit no. our engineers. We have told them, give us six, seven months. They're taking Jordanian engineers. We're, we're the biggest outflow of people for us right now is Jordan to Seattle, which is, makes me very proud. <laughs> Really difficult problems at Amazon from engineers. The, the beauty of Sukh is 
We did many things, and they were very good. Are, are they good because they're so complicated to do this game? No, I think they are the problems. They have to solve problems that they have to solve many problems that no one heard about, yes. But you're able to recruit. Do you train them? Which we, I do to do you recruit more successful people young. Yeah. You, you like we, need, young. We, need, we need to keep the young pipeline. And then you can you can some people even some people even some people. Uh, you tell us about your talent acquisition. How do you do that? So and you have so many of them. Yeah. So I think yeah. in the early days we obviously had no funding. We the first couple of colleagues we hired was to take that phone in the middle of the night and so we could sleep a little bit. So we hired people from the call center. Now we did something brilliant. We did not hire people that have sat in call centers before. But we hired people that we thought were smart. Right. And they have maybe never been in the call center. So actually listening to them being on the phone with our customers, we were crying because they were so bad at being on the phone with customers. But they were smart. And when you hire talent, they will grow. And it's so beautiful to see today, seven years later, some of the early people that we joined, that joined that had very junior positions, they have grown massively over seven years. And they are now like leading operations director, doing data science, doing so the first thing is Hire the right. You hire the right. Hire brains. And then you need to. You know, how, how do you retain talent? I mean, how important is culture? How, how hard did you work, you and your co founders, on creating the culture that retains talent? Culture, is, that, that culture is, is, is everything. And it's hard to scale. We've always said that we want to have mission. Hard to scale when you move from country to country. Or quickly. Yeah, and even when, or quickly you, when, you grow, when you grow bigger, it's hard to, uh, to retain. We always said we want to have missionaries, not mercenaries. Right. And when you're small, you have a purpose, you can't pay salaries, automatically you get missionaries because no one else is going to come to yes. you. Because they, okay, everyone that cares yeah. about money, they put goes around. Yes. When you're a little bit bigger, you are really fighting for talent. You need some more senior talent. We are importing a lot of talent actually back from the US. It's amazing, in the last two months, we got three very senior tech guys, Facebook, Tesla, we're bringing them into the region. Brilliant. Now, to do that, you need to start paying a bit more, a bit more competitive salaries. And as soon as you start getting into paying competitive salaries, then the question is, why are people here? Are they here because of their salary, or because of the compensation, or are they here because they believe in your mission? So it actually gets harder to find the right motivation as you become bigger. And, and do you have to preach that culture all the time? Are you, are you like uh, continuously uh, living, breathing, struggling preacher of talent, of, uh, of culture? But if you took your advice, you so said you, you spent most of your time traveling from city to city yes. and doing the bad Did you news. do that? Did you have to do that? We did it all the time. In the last two years, I think we have dropped the ball a little bit because we've been so busy with stuff. Okay. But it is. That's the only thing that matters. Come here. So uh, let me take a macro view of that really quickly. And you've been, you've been on the, on the you, you have a problem like running, but for different kinds of problems. For the global players that have come to town that compete with you have been coaching your talent, which is a testament that to you and, and your production. So I think you can tell us about uh, uh, Just on a, on a global perspective, I think over the last two decades, what I've seen is when we first started paying, there was a big complaint that people couldn't access talent. Um, what ended up happening is over time, again, just because there was information available, you realize that there was a tremendous amount of amazing talent both in the region and interested in working in the region. And the comparable we use all the time is the leading Swiss job site gets on average one to two applicants per job. Um, in the UK, if you were to advertise a job on a leading UK site, you'd get about 30 applicants per job. In the US, that number is close to 50. In the Middle East, if you were to post a job, you'd get north, north of 1,000 applicants per job. So it is the highest applicants per job you will get anywhere. So people who tell me there isn't talent, that's just not true. Um, also, most employers, and we survey this all the time, will tell you that the hard skills are available in the region. So if you're looking for someone who's a great data scientist, or a Java developer, or a mobile app developer, or whatever it is, you will find that universities actually do a pretty decent job of preparing people. Right. The biggest challenge is a work ethic one, where, again, the vast majority of people, if they've grown up in the West, by the time they graduate from university, have worked 
have had multiple so work experiences. They intern and have summer jobs, they understand that. In our part of the world, you graduate with a degree and you have no idea what it's like to be in a workplace or what customer services or work with a team. And that ends up being the biggest issue. However, let me say this. Again, so I've talked about the talent exists, and for the longest time, it felt like you wanted any talent from anywhere in the world, it was really easy to bring it in. So you wanted that amazing MIT graduate. Right. That MIT person was interested in being in Dubai or in being in the region. In the last six months, for the first time in my 20 years of doing this, I'm beginning to see great talent try to find exits from the region. So these data scientists, these engineers, etc., from across the region are now trying to find. And do you think why? Is this? Is I, I, I think the are they, are the, they? the general uh, sort of gray clouds, economically or politically or socially across the region, have let a lot of the best talent now question: Is this the long-term solution? And in most cases, when you see it happen, you know, we have the reverse. Brain drain over the last two decades, where oh, brain, it's going to be brain more like that. Yeah. and now it feels like we're beginning another brain drain, and and that scare is scares me tremendously. And, but I want to add. We're out of time, but I think uh, this is you. Right if you don't mind, we'll, we'll take five more minutes if you're enjoying this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 I think there is a light of hope, though. We, I actually see it, see it differently, which is particularly if you're a super strong tech person. You want to work on fantastic challenges, tough challenges. And you know, you're not gonna go work for a bank or a telephone company. So if you were this amazing engineer sitting in Silicon Valley, you work for Facebook, you work for Twitter, and you think I want to move back home to Arab world or subcontinent, where would you go, right? You're not gonna go and work for telephone company X or bank Y. So companies like Kelly and Soon and many others that are starting to come up, we're starting to get scale and starting to get to ch technical challenges that are exciting. And you need one, one talent. So talent or even I'm speaking on the phone. Three years ago, when we talked to talent in the valley, they were like, dude, who are you doing? Hang on. Right. Now our people are like, wow, oh, you're doing stuff at scale. Wow, forget about the money. Your technical challenges, your technical, your technical challenges are, your technical challenges are interesting. Okay, let, let me, let's talk, right? Yes. So I actually think that there is, yeah. what I care most about, what control I care control over the most right? about for the region, is we need to create companies here where tech talent can come and learn, and new talent can learn and grow from uh, our own talent. From our own talent, yes. To solve the issue of our economy. You need the mentors at the tech level. Right. You need the mentors at the tech level. That's how you learn and, and the practice okay. of the design. That's how you learn the practice of the design. It's a craft question. Process and suddenly you are working on multiple problems at the same time, and you are organized around them, and teams can independently innovate, and you are able to merge that in. So you're not doing it in sequence like we used to do. And that comes from really it's a craft. It's like a doctor in a, in a surgery having to do all the processes. Same for technology. But I do agree with myself. The, the problems are significant. They're not easy. As we scale, they become right. Really, really, but we have now 100 million Islam on the side, which is an item. To manage that at scale, from all kinds, serve, discovery, all the things you have to work with, you have to develop the best people for Arabic, to translate that, whatever. It's at scale. We're operating at just like any you other are. country, at any other Amazon site. So, my last question, and I, I wouldn't let you go not talk about exits, because everybody talks, talks about exits. I'm not going to go into the details. The critical element in what you guys did in terms of whatever value, I mean, again, the money is not the but sometimes it does. Will we, are we, and I'm arguing that we are going to have the next, the next generation of graduates of Kareem and Sue. As you get, as you merge, as you do whatever you do, you branch, you will have people that have experience these fantastic organizations in the region and say, it was fantastic working with you, Ronnie, I'm gonna go start my business. And they would get their stock options, they become whatever the new set that you had. Are we gonna get flooded uh, in the region in the next two or three years uh, with new startups, with new money, with a rejuvenation of uh, entrepreneurship free of all in the region? 
think it's natural. You yeah. can't be perfect to get to a stage where they've learned a lot, they've gone through a process, they've seen a call play out, and they have the drive, and they may have been working on problems that can take outside the scale. And they have learned this entrepreneurship inside the they've, learned, they've seen it happen, they've, they've maybe even left and worked at a bigger company and saw how you know, unexciting it is, the problems are not worthwhile, and they said, you know what, entrepreneurship is for me. So we have people maybe leave, go to a company as they were expert in this in their in their field, and then right away figured out, you know, this is not for me. I've built and born and I've, I've excelled in an entrepreneurship environment and a lot of mature. So we saw we had that script written before by, people, by, by PayPal, by, by Matu. Our exit was seven, seven companies. Seven companies from InstaShop, Wing, uh, Q Express, Pay for, Helpbit, and Sue. It was a one company. And you still there? All of them were on their own and standalone stand 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 businesses. Stand 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 they're all standalone businesses that do. Brilliant. You know, they're doing great. And the last word is, so are, are we going to get, uh, are we going to start to, uh, I'm starting to feel the, like the like grave guys in the marketplace itching to build businesses. Itching. So, so uh, you know, our purpose, we start agreeing, and still our purpose, is to simplify the full lives of people and build an awesome organization that can inspire. How do you inspire? You try to do some good stuff, and then you want to have people that go out, right? So in this time, we're in the middle of this acquisition. It's a time when people reflect on, do I want to be part of Kareem in chapter two, or do I want to go out and do my own thing? And some people are choosing to go and do their own thing. Some of them are sitting in this room. <laughs> when they come and say, hey, I'm going to go and do my own thing, I cry, like, deeply, for 10 minutes. <laughs> and, and then, please, please, please. and then, and I try to convince them why and do everything. Block the passport, body good. <laughs> and then I say, awesome, go out If you're going to build something, I said, you to let them go. Yeah. But if you're going to build something, how can I do anything but, but to bless you? If I have money, I'll invest in you. I'll try you to do anything. <laughs> but if you're gonna go to do something like boring stuff, no people. But. <laughs> So yes, I hope I hope that it's happening. I think we have a lot of entrepreneurs. I think there's a lot of capital coming into the region, which is beautiful. The thing I'm concerned about is that they might have too much money, and we will have you know, most companies will not succeed. And I just hope that we won't have too big of a backlash because some companies will crash, which is natural. But many of the investors are not used to this. So they'll see one failure and then they'll be like, oh no, this thing doesn't work. We have to be. This is the real time proof point. Let's, we have to allow for some companies to fail, some to succeed, some, some founders will fail, they will try again, they will fail, they will try again, and then they will succeed. We have to allow for this. Absolutely. Mark, 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 and Reason, Mark and Reason said, uh, Silicon Valley is not as successful as it was in the past 10 years because there are so few companies failing, which means there's too much money that keeps companies alive that should be dead. Right? So, uh, and Silicon Valley was built on, on the graveyard of so many, so many fantastic uh, companies that eventually became startups. Uh, I think we covered some, some cool stuff. Did I miss anything here? Do you want to do? Are you reaching your to say something? No, no, no. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>